Hello and welcome to another lesson about language development. In this lesson we're going to talk about uh, the vocal tract development and the very early sounds that you're able to make as an infant. And we're going to talk about specifically why it is we don't start practicing talking as soon as we're born. And the answer is because our vocal tract and our ability to coordinate the pieces of our vocal tract is not yet in place. Um, and so the sounds that we make that are very early sounds really don't sound very much like speech sounds at all. Um, and in this lesson, we're going to explain why that might be. So we're actually going to start out by talking about something that appears at first glance to be a sort of a, a problem with the anatomy of the adult vocal tract. Um, and this has to do with the epiglottis. Now, we talked in a previous lesson about how the epiglottis is there to stop you from breathing your food in. Right. So we have two pipes in our vocal tract. Uh, one which goes to our lungs and the other one which goes to our stomach. These are called the trachea for the lungs and the esophagus for the um, And this is how the, uh, the epiglottis is supposed to work, is, is to help you sort out which pipe your food goes down. So when you're breathing, when you're breathing in air, which you want to go in your lungs, your epiglottis is raised up just and, and opens up your lungs like a big trap door, right? So when you breathe, um, your lungs are on the left here and your stomach is on the right. And so when you breathe, the air can come in through your nose, down into your trachea and into your lungs. Um, it can also come through your mouth in an adult human vocal tract. You can breathe through either your nose or your mouth, which is nice when you have a stuffy nose. Right. So this is how breathing is supposed to work. Um, following, on the other hand, you accomplish by closing off that epiglottis. You seal that trachea up so that your food doesn't go down your uh, trachea. Now this, um, so this is what it's supposed to look like. So you have a piece of food in your mouth and you swallow it down. It runs into the epiglottis and says, nope, can't go there. And so it goes down into your stomach instead, right? So that's how swallowing is supposed to work. Let's watch an animation illustrating how this is supposed to work. So notice this person has food in their mouth and they, they first close off their nasal passage using their velar region. And then as the food goes down, that epiglottis flops down and there the food goes down the esophagus, right? So that's how swallowing is supposed to work. Now, unfortunately, um, you have to control that epiglottis with your brain. And it's a fairly good, um, this works fairly, you don't have to think about controlling your epiglottis very much but it does sometimes not happen quite right. So maybe you are laughing while you're trying to eat or something like that. You're, you're actively pushing air out of your lungs at the same time as you're trying to push air into your, you know, swallow your food, or maybe you're distracted, uh, or maybe you're unconscious, for example. Um, this can create problems if your epiglottis doesn't close. So you have food in your mouth and you start to swallow it, but that epiglottis didn't close for whatever reason. And that can go right down the wrong pipe into your lungs and boom, you're choking, right? So this is how choking happens is if your epiglottis reaction, which is usually something that you don't have to think about, like controlling your breathing or whatever, it, but you can have food go down the wrong pipe and you can choke. So that seems like a problem with the human vocal tract. Um, actually, if you look at the infant vocal tract, which is slightly different from the adult vocal tract, the first thing you can notice is that the epiglottis is in a completely different location. So right there at number six, where the arrow is pointing, is where the epiglottis is. And in an infant, that epiglottis is right at the back of your mouth. Um, so how does this work? Here's our little um, toy infant vocal tract here. And we've got an epiglottis that's sitting there right at the back of the mouth. Um, and, and we've got the esophagus leading to the stomach and we've got the trachea leading to the lungs. Um, now, so when we watch an infant breathe, the breathing works just fine. Air comes in through the nose. The epiglottis doesn't block the trachea, so it can go straight to the lungs. So breathing works great in an infant. Um, what happens when an infant tries to swallow? Um, so if an infant has food in its mouth, or in, in most cases for infants, they're drinking milk at this stage, right? Um, what happens is they try to swallow it, it runs into the epiglottis, and it can't go any further, right? So if you try to swallow anything with your epiglottis open, it's physically impossible for an infant to swallow anything with the epiglottis open. So instead, the epiglottis flops down, and now when they try to swallow something, it goes straight into the stomach. Um, this is really nice. So infants can't choke because their epiglottis, if it's closed, they can't swallow, or if it's open, they can't swallow 
And if it's closed, then they're good. They won't choke. Um, this seems really great. Like, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to choke to death? Um, and actually, if you look at other related apes to humans, um, uh, they have a similar structure of their vocal tract to that of an infant, right? Uh, if you look at this chimpanzee, you can see both of them have the epiglottis basically right at the back of their throat. Um, so it's almost impossible to swallow without that epiglottis being down, right? So it should be almost impossible for a chimpanzee to choke, just like it's almost impossible for an infant to choke, which is really nice that it's almost impossible for an infant to choke if you are a nervous new parent, for example. Um, so we like this idea that you wouldn't have to choke to death, right? But but the fact remains that our anatomy shifts as we grow older, right? Our 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 our, our, our epiglottis drops lower and provides us with that opportunity to choke if the reflex doesn't work right. So why does this anatomy shift? Do we want to choke to death? Um, the answer is we need to talk. And many of the sounds of speech require that that epiglottis and that, um, and in particular, our voice box must be lower in our vocal tract. And so the reason that this anatomy shifts is because we want to be able to produce those speech sounds. So I've just told you that this, this sort of infant vocal tract must not be sufficient to produce the sounds of speech. So let's talk about um, what it looks like when an infant tries to produce speech sounds or speech-like sounds, right? Um, so remember that the main source of sound when we're speaking is our vocal folds, which reside within the larynx, which is right there in an infant's vocal tract, right? Right below the epiglottis. Um, and, and on our toy one, we'll place it right there. So that's where our larynx is. So if you want to produce a speech sound as an infant and you want to go out through the mouth, right, that sound, that air goes up, 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 runs into the epiglottis, which is raised and is blocking off the mouth. So you can't have speech sounds go through the mouth. Let's try if we lower the epiglottis and see what happens, right? So here we've now lowered the epiglottis and now our problem's even worse. We can't get anywhere, right? So as long as you have the epiglottis raised, um, there is a way that that speech sound can get out, or that sound that we make with our larynx can escape, but only through the nose, right? So you have to go through this nasal passage in order for any sounds to go out. So this is like humming, right? So the only sounds that newborn babies can produce are nasal sounds. And this is the way that the vocal tract is for the first month of life, right? Until you get to be about a month old, or maybe even more than a, more than a month old, the only sounds that you can produce are nasal sounds. And you can hear that if you listen to the ways that babies sound um, when, when, when they're really freshly newborn. So this is a, the sounds produced by a one-year-old baby. Um, so listen and, and see, you can, you can hear it sounds all like it's coming out his nose. <laughs> Right, so you can hear those little infant, really newborn baby cries are those really nasally ones. And most parents will tell you that they can recognize that newborn baby cry because it really sounds acoustically different from the cry of a child who's even a month or two old, right? will start to sound different because um, that, that, that epiglottis and the, and, the, and the larynx are gonna start dropping. So if we want to make more complex speech sounds, the larynx needs to be lower, right? You, you have to be able to make sounds that aren't just nasal, but how much lower does it have to be, right? How, how much do we have to actually lower that, that um, larynx? Um, so if we look at our little, our little child, we can imagine lowering that uh, epiglottis just enough so that there's a little hole so that you could technically choke, right? Let's imagine you have that. So now we have the epiglottis doesn't block the mouth when it's lifted, um, but it's still higher up than in an adult. Remember, um, for an adult, the, the epiglottis is quite, quite low in the vocal tract. Um, now when we have speech sounds, they can escape through the mouth or the nose, right? So this is, um, if all you care about is being able to make oral sounds, um, then really your epiglottis doesn't have to drop that much. Uh, you just have to be able to drop it just enough so that you can uh, make those oral sounds. And this is sort of what 
uh, a chimpanzee's vocal tract does, right? It drops it just enough so that you can still make oral sounds, um, but not enough that choking is ever a really big risk, right? Um, the food still mostly just flips down the trachea all by itself, or flips down the epiglottis all by itself so the trachea gets full, right? Um, this is sort of the shape of a two to three month old infant's vocal tract, right? So once you're two to three months old, you can cry through your mouth, um, which makes a very different acoustic sound than that newborn baby crying through your mouth. Um, but there is still some significant uh, differences between um, uh, the vocal tract of an infant who, even, even an infant that can make oral sounds. Um, so when we look at an adult's vocal tract, there is this big chunk of tongue right there at the back, which we've called the tongue root. Um, in an infant, that area of the tongue is much smaller because the epiglottis starts much higher up in the vocal tract. Um, and this really reduces the mobility of the tongue in an infant, right? So the tongue really can't do very much besides sort of go up and down a little bit. Right, and there's also problems for an infant with motor control, right? So infants are also learning motor control, uh, and so tongues aren't doing as much partly because of that, but it's largely because this tongue root region is really small, and so infants have a, this really flat tongue, uh, which can't do as much as the adult tongue can do. So in this two to three months zone, even though you can make oral sounds, right? So you can make sounds that aren't, aren't um, uh, uh, nasal vowel sounds, um, you, Really, the only sound that's going to be an oral sound at this point is K and G sounds. So you can go ga, 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 right? Most of them are going to be pretty nasally. Um, and they haven't yet realized how to close off the nasal passage to make sounds that are purely, uh, that don't involve the nose at all, right? So when we make the sound ah, that does not involve the nose at all. Um, but you can also make the sound ah, which involves both the nose and the mouth. And those are more like the sounds that two to three month old infants are making, right? Um, so this is called the gooing or the cooing phase of babbling, right? So this is when you can make sort of sounds that sound like ba, 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 right? Um, but that's about the only sound that you can make physically with your vocal tract at this point. In time. Um, but once you get to be about four to six months old, your tongue root is starting to develop. So look at that, that's a lovely little tongue root. This child is actually um, seven months old in this image, um, but you can see that that tongue root is starting to develop. So you're getting some increased tongue mobility by the time you're four to six months old. Um, your larynx is still dropping, it's still quite high, but it's um, lower than it was significantly for a newborn. Um, which means that once you're four to six months old, you can start to really make non-nasal vowel sounds, right? So these are the ones that don't involve the nose at all, right? So you can close off your nasal passage and start making sounds that are just going through your mouth. Um, you can still make those K and G sounds. Um, uh, consonants at the front of the mouth are going to come later, um, and that has that, that's complicated. It has to do with tongue mobility. It also has to do with motor control. And it also has to do with just learning how, how sounds of speech are made by trial and error, right? So this doesn't come until a little bit later. Um, but infants during this phase are working on several really important skills for speech. So the main thing they're working on is how to control the airflow out of their lungs and through their, uh, through their vocal tract. So that involves breathing, right? So figuring out how to control their breathing, how to take breaths while they're in the midst of making sounds, uh, how much air they need to pull into their lungs. They're building strength in their diaphragm, which controls how your lungs expand and contract. So a lot of stuff having to do with sort of simple tasks of breathing. Um, they're learning how to get their vocal folds to vibrate at different amplitudes. Now remember, amplitudes determine how loud your voice is. So in this four to six month stage, this is when kids are learning how to yell and how to cry really loudly um, and how to, to use their vocal folds quietly as well. Right, so this is how you learn to control the different amplitudes, and that all has to do with how much air is flowing over your vocal folds and how much, how tightly you're holding your vocal folds and all that stuff. They're also learning um, to control how their to, to make their vocal folds vibrate at different frequencies, which is high pitched and low pitched. So you'll hear kids at this age going ah, right, and this is practicing coordinating 
their vocal folds so that they can make these different high and low pitch sounds. Um, they're also learning how to open and close different airways to cut off the airflow. So this includes learning how to make sounds that are purely oral by cutting off their nasal passage, learning how to make sounds that are purely nasal by cutting off their oral passage, right? So this is, you know, how to make a ng sound as opposed to a ng, a g sound, right? Um, and they're also learning um, how to close off their mouth completely. So you'll hear little kids at this stage go, ah, ma, ma. And this can sound like they're saying ma, ma, right? But really they're mostly just practicing opening and closing their airway. But it involves opening and closing the whole mouth usually at this stage. Um, and then lastly, they're learning how to build up pressure behind a closure. And this is really important for the development of continents. So remember that, um, that many of the consonants involve having pressure build up and then release. Um, and so children at this age will start doing things like blowing raspberries, where they go brrrr or brrrr with their tongue, right? And this is about learning how by building up pressure behind something, you can make a sound. Uh, and so this is crucial learning for how to um, create a consonant sound. Um, and lastly, they're learning how to show, shape their vocal tract to form different non-nasal vowels. So, so the ones that they're mostly creating are sounds like O oh and ah, right? So these are sounds that are possible for a vocal tract with this configuration to, to create. Um, they're not going to be able to make all of their vocal tract sounds, but they can probably go ma, 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 right? For example, that is a sound that you might hear from from a, a child this age. It would actually probably be more like, nah, right? You wouldn't hear them repeat it. But you can start to hear sounds that start to sound like babbling babies at this stage. Um, this stage of development is uh, called several different things. It's called vocal play. Um, it's called expansion, right? Because you're expanding the uh, variety of sounds that you can make. And it's called marginal babbling. And the thing that usually people call marginal babbling is this closing off different airways thing where you open and close your mouth while you're, while you're making sounds. Um, so the last big physical thing that is continuing to develop in a child um, is this area called the pharynx. And we talked about the pharynx in the tour of the vocal tract, but we basically just said it's an echo chamber. Um, the reality is that this is really important for making certain types of speech sounds, having a pharynx, um, is really important. Um, first of all, it, in, it is related to how mobile your tongue is, right? So how rounded your tongue is, um, is related to uh, how, how many sounds you can produce with your tongue. But it's also uh, really crucial to be able to constrict and, and expand this region of your vocal tract in making a lot of the important vowel sounds of speech. So for example, the sound E as in C involves the pharyngeal region um, expanding. And the sound oo, as in oo, moo, is important for this region. And ah, as in ba, is really important, right? So uh, this pharyngeal region is an important region that continues to expand throughout a, a child's uh, development um, and really needs to expand before a child can produce all of these different things. Um, and as you can see, so this is a chart on the, on the on the, on the horizontal axis here, we have the chronological age in months of, of children. And on, on the vertical axis, we have how much that larynx has dropped. In other words, how big is the pharynx getting um, uh, is, is what we're looking at. So on the right side, you can see the size that it is for adults, right? Um, it's clustered, you know, so, so males are the empty are, are the, the white triangles and females are the filled in triangles. And so you can see that males um, laryngeal descent is lower. And this is what leads to the difference between male voices and female voices is just the length of the vocal tract is different. Um, but in children, you can see that there is sort of a funny cutoff. In this region here, in about the first year of life, uh, this that length of that vocal tract is expanding rapidly. You are building your pharynx. You are going from having basically no pharynx to having a big, long pharynx. Um, and through the rest of children's development, that pharynx expands, but it's more or less um, coordinated with how big the child is, right? And so um, the, the relationship between head size and pharynx and stuff like that is going to be more or less consistent as a child ages.
right? So, um, so this first expansion period is really important, and this is going to continue to happen until a child is about this really fast expansion is going to continue to happen until a child is about 14 months old, um, which is right around when you start being able to produce sort of adult-like speech, right? So the, the size of this pharynx is really important um, and will continue to develop as we go through the next stage of language development, which is proper babbling, um, which we will talk about in the next slide.